If you ask a parent, they might call it intuitive. If you ask a musician, they might call it inspiring. To a doctor, it's groundbreaking. To a CEO, it's powerful. To a teacher, it's the future. If you ask a child, she might call it magic. And if you asked us, we'd say it's just getting started. How to develop strategies and how to develop them to generate some kind of competitive advantage. Now, one of the things that we discuss is the The challenges of today is making everybody think about how to compete with the information. So, whoever is able to have information on time and is able to deliver that information can be able to gain a very good. Um, competitive edge at the marketplace. So information is a key thing. And because you have to manage information, find a way of collecting it and then sharing it at the right time and applying it to the appropriate processes in the organization. It was important for us to study what information systems are. So today we'll go a little bit step and then understand what strategies are there that um, are there that can be used to analyze how Firms can use information systems to gain a competitive edge by and also by aligning them to their functions, the different functions of organization. So, in a natural sense, the first question we'll be asking ourselves is that what is an organization? So those are the things that we're looking at. Beyond that, what are the features of the organization? What are the elements of, of, of an organization that information systems can be added to? And we'll look at two different strategic frameworks for evaluating how information systems can be used to um, support company strategies. One of them is Porter's Competitive Forces Model. <laughs> now you know about that. I've a Porter level. This is my yeah, yeah, I know, I know about that. It is, because this is a more, more of a strategic management theory. So you see it in marketing, you see it in management, you see it in finance, you see it in different economics too. And he has a lot of frameworks. The other one too, the other one that he has the value chain model. Have you done that one too? Some of us say it is, some of us say it is. Yes, yes, yes. It was your question. But he reads. Some of us say Okay, so we look at that. That would be the class very interesting easy for you. But I thought you had not heard about my reporter. He's still alive. He teaches in Harvard. I don't know. But you can actually Google my reporter in YouTube and you see some of his lectures. He's actually, he does his lectures in all his videos. And he's a, he's a head or president of one of the strategic business units in Harvard, like one of the masters of knowledge in Harvard. So you can find out in the So he's quite old. In YouTube, you see his video there teaching, and even talking about how he is, his, his models, although they were uh, postulated quite in the 70s and uh, quite long ago, they are still relevant today. Some, all those are also argue that not, doesn't apply to every country or doesn't apply to every business. He still yeah. agrees that he still made one with some few modifications. So I would advise you that go to YouTube and then Google his name and you will see some of the lectures. Even on all the different frameworks, he still says he deserves normal lectures in Canada. Now, what is an organization in your own perspective? What are the definitions are written down? If I should ask you an example, or what is an organization? Are you doing ODM? What is an organization? This is why you are trying to do it. 
I said, on my own, pues, it's a system which have uh, 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 resources. So it's a kind of investment for me. I said, I'm just trying to start from your own words. Yes. You don't mention resources. I don't look at it. <laughs> you, know, you know, I was talking to him for a whole Okay, watch him. I'm listening. I am saying that in my own position is resources. And then we uh, interact with environment to get an output. Some of you work in different firms, so you don't tell me different perspective of what the organization is. Yeah. So social entity with more than one one person. Okay, it's a social entity which has more than one person which converts raw material into an output. So everybody is saying there's a conversion, there is some resources, and there's an output. Is there any other definition that is different? I, mean, I would say that it's a group of people working together to achieve a common Are you sure that everybody is working together in <laughs> conversation? <laughs> When the time is up for them to fire you, they can just look into your face and see that you're fired. Hmm. Working together to, or again, working together to achieve a problem. Any other? Yes. Uh, it's a structure that brings use of internal and external resources to achieve a resource. It's a structure that makes use of what? Internal and external resources to achieve results. That's very good. Structure. Okay. All of you are done. I think um, you are basically mentioning um, the technical definition. Not much more of the behavioral, also um, the other dimension, the behavioral definition. So, one, in the technical sense, an uh, organization um, has, is seen as maybe a system of maybe a set of interrelated components. That would work together to pick resources from the environment in order to produce an output. He also said the same thing that the resources may be internal and there were external. That means that there is the internal resources that are drawn when the employees, the assets the company may have. And then the external resources that that's the environment, the customers, and all those people, all those other entities that exist in the environment, that the company may interact with to be able to produce output. So one fundamental thing that I like about all that you said is that there should be an output. There should be why we are coming together as an organization. He says that, um, she said that there's a common goal. Others were also saying that there is um, a result. All this are defined in the Some people may have it as profit-oriented resource, others will be non-profit-oriented resource. Some will be social value they want to create, others will be something else. So there, there is a particular out. Then there is another definition that is a more in the legal sense, that's saying that a formal legal of entity. That means that there should be some kind of governing process and that makes it called organization. Who says it's an organization? Yes, we can say in the society we have come together to but what the legitimacy is. Is there any uh, nexus of contracts that is coming together so that we are bound to be doing this thing? Because you are saying, you mentioned that they come together and they do something. But what, why are they coming together? Is it just because of common purpose? If tomorrow morning I don't want to be, can I just walk out? And most of you know that in the very, in the, uh, our legal organization, you can't just get up and say you are leaving. There should be there's some contracts that you have that binds you to, to a constrain or an enable your to action. That is why we have the behavioral side, that there's a collection of what? Rights, privileges, and um, obligations and responsibilities. That are balanced, that maybe the members of the institution come together and try to find a balance of it 
and in through that, they go through more conflict and conflict resolution. But as you, as you said earlier, all this is for the purpose of what? Coming out of an output. So both of them are right, but just that the most important thing that we need to understand is that there is a structure that has come to be like, a set of people that have come to be like. There is an output, there is a process, and there is a need of resources to be able to generate the output. So looking at it from, um, from a diagrammatic perspective, this is how the technical resolution looks like. So we have an organization, generally there are some processes going on. It might be a production process. So you have to put inputs from the outside you know, and to, uh, to come out with an output. And you also should know that this same output comes out with this input. Yeah. 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 The farmer has an input, which is um, Workers form some kind of a mixed um, organization. They produce maybe cocoa beans. Cocoa board goes to buy them and also produces what? Chocolates. Somebody takes the chocolate, takes it to what? Um, maybe guava uh, and sells it from there. So somebody's input is another person's output. And sometimes some companies, some company, the way they are there, their input is their output. In some sense. They will produce in one of the divisions is producing something, another division is picking up that same output and using it for another process. For example, a company that produces itself. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So we can have that the technical division. But in the memorial one, we tend to see that we have the formal institution in there, and then there's some structure and uh, some of the rules and regulations that govern how the why the organization is and how it operates. And there are some processes too that the, the environmental resources go to and lead to environmental outputs. Now, the reason why we are trying to get the basic understanding of the organization is because we are going to try to see how we can align IT to organizational functions and strategies. Now, when, even though we are both the behavioral technical definition, I, will have a, I have a different definition of organization I want to share. And you can then do your own perspective. An organization is, um, I see it as a collection of individuals who left unattended will likely pursue individual goals. There is a similar definition in your book by a guy in the 70s. He was also explaining the same thing. I don't know whether I will just quickly read through. So that those who are called the sheet, draw and the then we can see what I am there. Same thing. Individuals who 
let them attend and we'll likely pursue the legal goals. That was the definition I put in here. Hence the need for processes like the rights, the duties, the values, the norms, and everything. And then again, there's a need for some structure so that people can be able to pursue similar goals in the organization. So, what did the information system does in the start of this? It enables us to observe the environment very well. So, in this particular diagram, what we tend to realize is that the information system stands here, and through it, we get information concerning how the environment, what is happening in the environment. We use information systems in one way or the other to monitor the environment, to monitor what is going on. For example, in some firms spend that spend considerable time just listening to radio to know what other competitors are doing, depending on what kind of um, industry you are in. Others for other firms spend their time on the internet actually monitoring uh, news and information. Because every news that is happening in maybe got an oil producing company, every news happening in the Gulf of Mexico affects them. How we understand what I'm trying to say. So to some extent, we use information systems to study the environment. Then we get information from competitors, get information from governments, customers, financial institutions, and then even monitor the, the cultural environment that we work in so that we could be able to work effectively as a firm. So that if your information system is not well aligned with your processes, you must be able to get the right information at the right time. And that's what we're going to try and explore throughout the session today. So how can you align it to your strategy so that you can get the best out of them? First of all, I'll mention the impact of your IT on the firm. So let's look at some of the technology and economic impacts of technology. Economic impacts of technology. Now there are two impacts we're going to look at. One of them on the impact on transaction costs. And then the, the cost of participating in the market, finding other suppliers, finding the buyers, that's what called transaction costs. And then the cost, another type of cost we're looking at agency costs, the cost of managing your employees and supervising them. Now IT has an impact on these two types of costs economically. First of all, because as a firm, we need to when you are, in your, you are out there, you are producing some outputs, and you need to get the outputs to some customers. You are always in the market trying to find out who is the best customer for your product, or who are you targeting. Secondly, you also need to find trading partners who can you can buy your supplies from at a very good price. Hence, you are, as if you are able to use the information system to coordinate these two activities better, you may be able to reduce your cost, your transactional cost. Initially, if I am selling, let's say, to Nettles, and I want to sell it to a large population of people in, um, let's say, Gabor countries, what do I have to do? I have to go to go my room, house, house by house, lodging my room, and sell it. But if I have information technology, maybe what I can do is I'll put a sign board there, do you want to stretch for Tamale? Call this number. Haven't you been seeing that? And then by calling it, you know that I, I, by the time I walk to a place, like, at least there is a very good possible chance that you will buy something because you have negotiated for the thing. It's just like how the those who want to sell their cars, buy them or for something. And then they write, <laughs> you know, something. Or some. So the car before it's sold is already for something. The sun is very rich. So it's, She's only selling cars. <laughs> so someone writes that, call this number. Nobody buys price. You always write, call this number. And when you call the number, you call the right hand number down. That number is always active. Call it, say, yes, how can I help you? How much is your kid? Okay, you like, okay, give one thousand. <laughs> how much will you give? Then they start it. So what we start realizing is that we get an opportunity of using technology to reduce our cost of going to the market and finding buyers and finding suppliers and finding sellers for the products that we have. So we can sit at one place to do that. And hence we are reducing our cost of what? Transaction. Our cost of coordination of what? Of getting into the marketplace and getting our product out there. Good. Secondly, the things that we cannot do, we can also what? Outsource them. And if you know what outsourcing is, and you find a better person who has the core competence in what you are trying to do and will do better. 
what I mean by that is if you are doing marketing, sales, and distribution at the same time, and you realize that distribution means that you have to buy cars and you can yourself, what do you have to do? You can absorb distribution so that a, a firm that has a network of cars and a network of depots can just collect it from you and distribute on your behalf, which actually reduces your assets that you need to invest in your business. And maybe you outsource it. So they did very well, better than you can maintain it at a cheaper price than you owning all these properties, owning all these employees. Because if you are going to own all these employees and uh, uh, properties, mind you, you also have to pay for the rights for it, your maintenance, the security. Maybe with some of them will be there, you know, they will be there, you know, they will be there, you know, they will be there, you know, you have to take care of them. So outsourcing gives us an opportunity to send out. Other, our, sometimes our core competencies to other divisions or other institutions which can do the work. Because I recorded that in around 2003. When they used to do everything themselves, production, they do. sales and marketing and distribution, they do. So then they realized that they started getting competition from um, the foreign products that are coming to the market. But I was one of the very first companies in Ghana, and um, beverage companies, and holy beverage companies. That focused on um, using local populations on their needs and their products. Because at the time we came into the market in the 80s, it was when they were doing their drink in the mom's backyard or in his house. At that time, the, most of the drinks were being sold in Mumbai, and it was the indigenous drinks like Indonesia were not being packaged or bottled well. But the other drinks like Gaganios and all the other ones, like Johnny Walkers. Come in very good ones and packages. So they realized that one of the ways of getting to the market was to do a good packaging. And also have a Ghanaian drink went in, in groups. It's a, it's a social event. So you have to find a way of creating a social connotation around it. That is why they started sponsoring Adorant and then even took their name and named not the white Cassandra, but it's an appellation of the chief from the Masa region. So they actually uh, put it on. And almost, almost all the other things that come in has some local connotation uh, 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 so that you create the desire to drink and the desire to relate to it. That is why one other foreign drinks came in the Renata C competition in the early 2000s. Um, you could see that a company changed their drink shanty to Bosue, if you can remember. Yeah. And there was a dancer who go under the road and then you go to the dance and come out up there. Now, the whole idea about that advert was to show you that the uh, their yeah, drinks also connects to the society. Then that will hit Casablanca like, very much, and you have to go back and see that if all this competition is coming on, then we have to start doing what? We start looking at what is our core competition. We can do what? Production. We can do sales and marketing. That is our source of distribution. So then they started outsourcing distribution. They even put, they build their website, and they put some of the uh, documents on their website, and they could actually become a, a, a distributor. And they even had a list of distributors on their website. Now, it later on helped them because they could really direct some of their resources back into what was important for them and even expand the brand into other products. And no one all those other ones came later on. So you have to know that you need to reduce your transaction cost. Another way of reducing your transaction cost is also by using IT for other kinds of purposes, like meeting of employees. And that thing is like, you know, I have a video conference, you don't need to be there, and you can actually have meetings. Or you have not heard of it, most kind. Yes. Yes. Some of you do that. I even, some of these even use the very basic ones, like Skype, to actually do meetings with some of the suppliers and other clients, the customers all over. Now, as of now, some companies like, I just told you, Fidelity, you can use Facebook to, to connect the customers and even answer some queries directly. So you've got video conferencing technology that can also help us. That you don't need to go to Kumasi where the client is. If you can sit in a crowd and connect with you. So transaction costs coming back to what I said. I think there was market transaction costs with a firm. Making it worthwhile the firm to transact with other firms rather than grow the number of employees. So instead of having more employees, more assets, you rather reduce your assets and use IT to leverage or network with the same people that you wanted to reach. <laughs> Let me just give you a very simple example. If I have employee uh, customers in range, 
Uh, do you reduce your liability or your assets because your your staff in another way is an asset at the same as a liability? Guarantee is true. I'm not looking at it from that particular. I'm thinking about the cost of it. But okay, if I lose the word liability here, then I will, what I'm going to explain will come up better to you. For example, I go and get um, a deal to supply um, maybe these chairs to customers in massive. Then because the deal is very good, I'm thinking about the fact that I should have a customer service representative traveling between here and Massey and Accra. And every time he's traveling, now hire somebody new. I have to pay for his social media. The social insurance, the social security. I have to look after, I have to have the training allowance, all those allowances that come are going to be given to God that person. However, the person may just be traveling to the place once in a month or um, once in three months. And we do most of the discussions with them, we can do it over phone. So why don't I even train an internal person who will do the traveling once? In a month, and that can that person can add it to his job. But that is the use IT to have a consistent and maybe continuous engagement with that same office. So I give them a dedicated phone number. I tell them that you can always be online with us. If you have any problem, call us, we will respond to you. And if there's a need for us to get, we get somebody on the bus to bring to you. There's no need for me to hire somebody, maybe relocate him to Kumasi, give him a house there. And then pay for all of that. So even though it's coming as an asset, it's a liability because at the end of the day, I'm spending much more than the value. But the investment of doing IT maybe relatively could be high at that one point in time. But over time, I gain that managing that person who are going to pay his end of selling benefits. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. So with that, I will not go the number of employees. I rather invest in IT. Because this is how the gap looks like. Your transaction cost increases as your firm size increases. No, as your firm size increases, you are forced to increase your transaction cost. Especially when you are getting more opportunities, like what I said. The traditional way is to tell them that high more employees, or oh, the job has come, high more employees. So if IT can let you keep the firm size aware test or even reduce the firm size, then you are likely to also be reducing your what? The transaction cost and then your returns on that particular project could be high. But this is not for all, all cases. There are some cases that you need on the job, you really need to pass a body and relocate into that place. And if possible, that means that you are going to add it to what, whatever you're going to charge the, uh, the company that you are doing the transaction for, you are doing the consultancy for, you are doing the job for. This is one set. But let's look at the other side. Which will also further explain what the other, the other gentleman wants to do. The other side is the agency cost. The agency cost is the cost of managing the internal resource. That's the employee himself. So managing and supervising. You know, when I bring in a new person, I may have to give him a supervisor. And some supervisors, the more mentors, mentees they have under them, the more maybe if you are one person, you are giving him okay, if you are mentoring one person, you are giving him 500, you are getting the extra, every three months. So if I give him one mentee, that means I'm also increasing his how much I have to pay to him. And the new person I bought, you have to pay him more. So if IT can reduce the agency cost by making the firms grow without adding the cost of supervising it, and without adding the cost of um, new employees. But I will end up spending more on the employees if I keep on just increasing my, my number of employees. Just like what happens in the ministry. Like after some time, they are very redundant names in the system. They are not actually doing anything. Because some people just come at a correct time. And I feel to know about you, but when you realize that in some foreign institutions, they like right and apart from the cost of everything is now on contract. So when you are coming in as a new employee, you know that it's just three months when the process is over, you are going. But traditionally in the quite a number of companies in Ghana. They will end up hiring the person, even though the three months will be over, they have brought the person in or will find for the cost money and give up to find something else for you to do. The guy keeps hanging around and it becomes a liability of being an asset. He's, at the end of the month, not paying. But what are you are getting from him? And there are others too who are put in positions that they cannot do their job. Or because of IT, we can replace his job 
the job that people are doing with one technology. So it's either we re scale these people and put them in the departments. Otherwise, uh, software will come and replace them and still be paying for them to be there. So change management along IT is a very big challenge in many institutions. Sometimes you have to do a bank. There was a firm, a hotel in um, Egypt. Um, if you ever had King, King Hotel goes online, you go there, you can read about it. And this hotel wanted to go online and start doing reservations online. Not that everybody is doing that. You can book online. However, they are forgotten that the current system in the hotel is the marketing officers go out, find people to come and book, and they get commissions. So now you bring the software, the marketing officer has to redirect the person to what the software to be the book and to read the reservation. How does he get his commission? So when they came to install the system in the firm, one, and one of the challenges they had is they didn't know many of the internal staff didn't know about IT, so they needed to be trained. So they had to bring in those who knew something about IT. And initially, they just wanted to get the team away, but right? they started fighting because they knew, no, they know the customers. Even though they don't know IT, they know the customers. They can tell our customer that, now our manager is not very good, our hotel is not very good, go to this other hotel. So the manager needed to have, to have to find a lot of balancing work. They change. So he paired them up. New guy, work with old guy, and get help the old guy, teach you something about how the firm works, and also teach you how to use the, uh, the computer. <coughs> and even though they were not doing any bookings through um, them, but through the reservation, they still were paying some commissions to them. If they are, are you know, some of the marketing officers have their own clients, like this guy has found his mind, any kind of family comes, even though you, you, you book him in, he, I brought him to the hotel. I know in many hotels in there, they are just like that. Some clients are there, when they come, they ask for a particular person to talk to, to work, because they know the kind of bedroom, the room they want, they, they know the kind of settings they want in their room and everything. So they started, they kept on paying them for some time, I think for about three months, until they were able to train them to get to know much more about technology and then take over the, take over the roles very well. So you can't just, even though IT can help us reduce agency costs, you need to understand that you can't just go in the next visit to replace what the internal staff. Maybe it can help you reduce or prevent you from hiring more employees. But you always need to understand the change management that comes from this. So we have seen two economic impacts of what IT does. One, in terms of transaction costs, we're going out there looking for our customers, new customers, new suppliers, new buyers. We could have sit on our place, advertise the thing on the web, or advertise it through the radio, and we would end up having the same impact. And secondly, agency costs. Reducing the cost of managing and smallizing employees and reducing the need for us to increase the number of employees for a given task or role. My take on this is the fact that still when it comes to certain type of businesses and certain type of target markets, we still need more employees to go out. An example is what we call or what we I call and some banking. That nature of what the Nigerian banks do that they take national service personnel, <laughs> put them in the sun and tell the journey for clients. <laughs> so you know about that, they put it there and say you, by the end of the week, you are supposed to bring seven or eight, they give you a quota. If you are not able to meet it, you see them calling all their friends that come and open an account, come and open an account. <laughs> so they can put them in a marketplace and they walk in and make sure they mobilize all the resources. Because the sun back is that they are working in the sun looking for banking clients. <laughs> Uh, 
and the sales rep came and they told her to come. And he said, Did you take a move? He said, In the food net. He said, He said, You took a move, but he said, You didn't sign, so you have to come and do some. Now, she said, I can't do that. You are, now you, you are, you are protecting yourself, so you know. <laughs> are you sure you are doing well on the top of the church? Let's not go there. <laughs> so, sad banking will become one of the ways, it's one of the ways that banks are able to get new clients. And that one, if you advertise on the people, why not? They will not bring you the kind of clients you're looking for. They're looking for people in the market. So, unless you want to use OKS and then this effort. Now, you can build people that want to attract the kind of people that you want. So, with agents, that's the same thing with agency goals. We can reduce firms and start to grow in size and complexity. Traditionally, they experience rising agency groups. So if we can prevent them from growing the size, the tendency is that we also reduce our agency groups. The graph is which are getting rich. Oh, the first size is here. Yeah. Agency cost is down here. You see your money? Yeah, page one and six. So what happens that IT does is it helps with flattening organizations. What by flattening organizations is that it makes decision making be pushed to the lower levels. So that more people can make decisions at a given time because the information is accessible to a lot of people. Now this is a little bit conflicting because sometimes somebody is not authorized to make a decision, but now he's seen the information and can make a decision. It's happened in a number of hospitals before where because of the um, kind of registration of employee uh, patient data and uh, lab results. And some of the lab results come by email. And now a head desk for city sees the information and he knows that based on this lab results he can prescribe A, B, C or tell the client A, A, B, C. And sometimes nurses are forced to, because of all the information they have already seen, to do that. And they go and do it and the doctors come and complain that they are actually approaching on what they are supposed to do. This has been very uh, something that has been reported in North, North America a lot, where there are a lot of computerization, the patient data and history is there. Is so uh, after somebody has worked for about 10 years as a nurse, he knows certain things intuitively. Even though she might not have the qualification of a what of a medical doctor. So sometimes when you see some of the lab results and the patient's history, you can tell you or advise you on certain things. And doctors think that it's their role to do that. But now it's what information is made available mm -hmm. to them. And she is the one compiling it and bring it to your desk. So sometimes she knows the information and she can actually tell patients what to do. And that's one of the reasons why we say that IT actually threatens the organization. It takes decision making to the lower levels. People now have information, they can make certain decisions. But that is why you need to still keep the hierarchy, rules and regulations. So that you know that even though you are seeing it in the information, you don't you know you're not authorized to do that. You're not authorized to even tell the client. You're not authorized to um, notify the client about whatever it's supposed to be. For example, if you go to a shop and you are using your debit card or your credit card to buy something, and so posing that credit card has been flagged. Sometimes in some shops, you it's sort of, uh, you know, it, they describe it and the message comes on um, the screen. Some of the messages can come that the, the credit card has been flagged, it's a stolen credit card, and call the credit card agency. And the person will call it and call, and sometimes you advise where you need to be, and the person has got the mission. But when they come up to you, they tell you that, I think that I'm afraid there's something wrong with your card, it doesn't seem to be. Instead of telling you that this is what has happened that year, your, your card is a stolen card because you cannot actually accuse you. For all you know, you, you did this thing. Maybe your son took it and used it to do something to my drawn or it's maxed out. So they politely tell you something, then you say call your card, call your card company. So that you take the responsibility of calling your card company. But the person knows what is actually happening with them. There's another one that if it happens in a financial institution, like you're trying to access an account, you know you need to most people are working with people's hands. And people's names. Sometimes you go into the banks and they are, when they play games, you are going to collect it. You know, the guy, the guy is in Ghana, you are working in, his game in the UK. So, you pay down this, you want to go collect your money. And 
by that the child that day, the guy opens the screen and he sees the face, it doesn't look like you. Mm -hmm. Or there's something wrong with the sign check. Then you are carrying. What people do is that he takes his checkbook, he knows how much you are taking from sales room. So he signs that against that check for the next three months or four months, while he's away. So when the time the month is up, you just tear it and you take it to the place and then somebody leaves the amount blank so that you can fill it because you know when you see your place how much you get. They will catch it from the second. Okay. Now, sorry. It's risky. Yes, it's risky, but you know, people do it. They end up overdrawing their account. They do it in the name of friends, relatives, and um, pastor's son, all those things. <laughs> This is the truth I'm telling you. I think, I think some of you have had this place before. Now when you get there, they are trying to cash it out. And they realize that's not you. Well, you'll be there and they'll call the political and carry it out. That one will tell you you're afraid. Because that one is a little bit of, um, 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 they say it's from, um, you are trying to commit a crime. And you are actually committed a crime already by working in some thing. So there are two crimes there. You are trying to have a person to take from the person's account. So that can happen, and that case, they come in and they arrest you. So sometimes information that is given to um, an individual based on the individual's level of the organization, you may be able to say, make a decision on it, or may not be able, you can see the information, but not make any decision based on that. The other thing, the other challenge that um, information technology is also given is auto. In, in, in our current societies, looking at what's happening today, it has moved the competition to much more to, on information than the skills people just have. It's about who can have the information in order to use it faster. So in the marketplace, firms that are able to gather information, use them, and utilize them alongside their business processes are more likely to create value than other firms who might not be able to do that. And sometimes people think that it's more about the position somebody has um, when it came to organization, which is traditionally true. But sometimes you might go to some friends and you realize that, hey, even though you came with, you have been there for a long time, you might not be able to have the information. You don't know the knowledge in this particular technology. I have it. And they will give me a competitive edge in terms of hiring than you. So we, we, we always have that challenge of looking at it from that perspective. What do organizations need to do? Do you invest in the skills or invest in Knowledge. What will you do? You do good. Are you sure? For me, I'll say it depends on your competitive strategy. It's true. It all depends on your competitive strategy. Some environments are purely skill based. Very purely skill based. It's not how many schools, how many years for what. Education somebody has had. But some environments is also more about information and the ability to use the information. So now what we're going to do is that now that we understand how information is and what it does in organizations, we are now going to look at it specifically in different industries and try to see how can we use information to make us more competitive or to make us more competitive. So we will begin by using Porter's competitive forces model. And what my book, what I discussed some time ago. You have done that from such a So we also have done what is Porter's competitive forces model. We also have done it. What is it? But, okay. That quarter has some five forces model. That helps you to analyze um, the competitive strength of a firm in the industry that is working with. And so, uh, what are the five forces? What is an IG? Power of the Power of the The body, the body power of the Supplier. Supplies and buyers. 
So why is our first job in this in the industry? Now the culture talks about the fact that uh, a firm should be viewed in this uh, environment according to some of some five forces that can influence how the firm operates. And those five forces is what you are assisted out here. The bargaining power of what the suppliers, the bargaining power of what buyers, the threat of what substitutes us, the threat of what yield, and the traditional competition that exists in the union or the rival that exists in the industry. Some industries are very fast. Some industries are very fast. In Uganda, there's a story about the fact that one of the telecom companies went on to do this promotion. It came up at 555. And MTN said, okay, you are doing 555. We are going to P2. You see how low you come. And within a day, the company that did a 555 lost out. All the other firms went below the 555. And if that firm couldn't go down, I went to report to the regulator that <laughs> this is what you call an unfair competition. <laughs> they are giving to him. So you chose to go 555. And we wanted to go down and see whether you can come down low. So sometimes you have very strong rivalry in some industries. This is a better picture for us to see how it looks like. So you have bargaining power of suppliers, threat of union brands, bargaining power of buyers, and then threat of substitutes. And then in the middle, you have the rivalry between what? Is the same thing. Now, these things are relative. What I talks about the fact that if you are able to manage these forces and understand them very well, you can be able to use certain strategies to be able to take a lead in the marketplace. Why? How? How is that possible? So let me just point out. Traditional competitors. All firms share a market space with competitors who are continuously devising what new products and new new services. And they are also reducing the switching costs so that firms can leave other suppliers, other customers can leave you and come to join them. There is also new entrants, or there are also new entrants who um, can be able to enter into a particular industry. If an industry has a high form of new entrance, that means that what? The progress of entry to that industry is slow.